everybody, I'm Jennifer Hayward. I teach at the College of Worcester, which is a liberal arts college in Ohio. And I was kind of entertained to notice that I put a, a, a typo in my title, Fulbright Commission. The word is a sort of a hybrid between Spanish and English spelling of commission, which is, I, I liked it because I thought it captures where my head is right now in terms of this sort of hybrid managing of both languages. And one reason, one of many reasons I'm really excited to be here is that my small college in Ohio is really trying to boost our enrollment of Latino students and faculty as well, as so many of us are. And so when I go back, I'll be able to be part of that um, initiative. And also, I've already been talking with my students here about possible cultural exchanges with the US. So that's really exciting. So today I'm going to talk, uh, my talk today will have three parts. So first I'm just going to give a very broad and quick introduction to my project, then move into a little bit of the context behind the project, and finally introduce two of the figures I'll be working on today, or while I'm here in Chile, just because I think their stories are especially interesting. So my field is actually 19th century British literature, so it would seem a little bit odd that I'm here in Chile. The story behind that is in the 90s I visited Chile for the first time, fell in love with the country, and while I was here, people hearing that I worked on British literature just kept saying, oh, then you must know Maria Graham, you must know Thomas Cockrell. I'd never heard of these people, but I started reading Maria Graham in particular, who's one of the writers that I'll talk about in a little while, and she was fascinating, and at the same time I thought, you know, I could go on research leaves in Chile rather than in cold, wet Britain. <laughs> so here I am, <laughs> and it's actually been great. It's kind of serendipity because at that time in the 1990s, literary studies was moving in the direction of looking at post-colonial literature and looking at British colonialism much more seriously than it had done before. And with that move came a much increased focus on travel literature. The idea there is that travel literature tells us stories about other parts of the world, and therefore the 19th century British, just like the rest of us today, having read a lot about particular countries, already kind of knew what to expect when they got there, which can be very narrowing as well as broadening, right? So in the 90s, in history as well as in literature, again, there's this huge rise in studies of, post, of British colonialism. But one big gap in that literature is that imperial studies almost exclusively focused then, and still do to a great extent, on the formal territories of Britain, which were, of course, India and parts of Africa. So there was this very dominant focus, and people were really not interested in what the British were doing in Latin America at all. Of course, the British didn't have formal territories in Latin America. Um, so I like this phrase that Matthew Brown, a historian who's one of the few historians who does work pretty much exclusively on the British in Latin America, talks about this Latin America shaped hole in the discipline. The few scholars who do work on the British in Latin America came up with this concept of informal empire to explain what was going on here. And the idea is that there was economic dominance of trade in actually a little bit before independence in 1810 when the Spanish, because of what was going on in Europe with the Napoleonic Wars and so on, started to lose their grip on the South American continent, the British arose, uh, started arriving in droves on the shore, especially in Brazil and in Chile, and started engaging in trade. So there was this economic dominance, sometimes up to 40% of trade was in the hands of the British. So that's what this idea of informal empire is, but there's problems with it, as I'll come back to in just a minute. Another of the gaps in the research is that a lot of colonial studies in both history and literature tend to just talk about the British rather than 
thinking about whether a particular traveler or a merchant or whatever was English, was Scottish, was Irish, was Welsh. So we're starting now to add a lot more nuance, and I'll go into that in a minute as well. This, again, intersected really nicely with my own work because when I started looking into this field, I had no idea that Maria Graham was Scottish at all, which she actually is. She's always talked about as English. She talks about herself as English, which is something that I'll go into when I talk about her in more detail. So in this current historical moment with the Scottish referendum last year, with Brexit this year, it's more and more important to try to unpack some of those distinctions of national versus regional identity. Um, coming back to the idea of informal empire, a couple of the key figures behind this increased nuance that we've been adding to the idea of what it means to be British are the story of Linda Colley, who wrote a really influential book called Britons, in which she explores how the, uh, the concept of being British rather than English or Scottish or whatever came into being across the 18th and 19th century. And then Benedict Anderson's imagined communities, I imagine a lot of you have heard of. So his main argument is that across the 18th and 19th century, with the rise of print cultures, suddenly you could have a sense of what it meant to belong to a nation, a nation and a national identity rather than to a region just because of the increase in communications, people telling each other the same stories about what it meant to be British or French or Spanish and so on. Uh, with this increased attention to national identity though came a really strong strain of Eurocentrism. So Benedict, Benedict Anderson, for example, is really interested in the American independence movements in you know, North right down through South America into the Caribbean, but mostly for how they shaped European national identities, how Europe looked at South America and said, okay, hold on a minute, maybe we don't want to go in that direction. Let's think about how to reshape our political structures and so on. So the idea of informal empire is very much the British coming into South America and imposing its own dominance. Current scholars are trying to look much more at the other side of the equation, not this center periphery model, but look at the interactions. So one of my main focuses in my research here will really be to look at what the Chileans think of this British influence. How the Chileans see the incorporation of these British historical figures in their national imagination. Uh, even things like Las Onces, mm -hmm. the fact that there's, uh, I'm very happy and comfortable here because it's a tea drinking culture, which is great for me. I'm told that came from the British. Uh, in Viña years ago, I attended a parade in honor of the Queen's birthday. The English don't even do that, right? So there we were in Vigna. Uh, so the huge gap here is the ignoring of the Latin American perspective, and that's what I'm here to try to find out more about. So the larger project I'm not going to go into, but just so you can see the span of the writers that I'm working with. And these are all travel writers. They all wrote texts that have circulated and continue to circulate, telling stories about the parts of the world they visited. And they're all Scottish, although they're not usually talked about as being Scottish. Within Chile specifically, the Scots played a very wide range of roles. So I just wanted to put that up so you can see some of the activities that they were in. And a little bit of the intellectual context. So my larger argument in the book is that the Scots saw the world quite differently from the way the English, for example, would see the world. And so the way this project came about actually is that I became more and more interested in specific travel writers. And as I researched them, I realized, and this was really serendipity, that they were all in fact Scottish. So I started to say, okay, what is it about these Scots? And what it is about them is that 
they tend to get much more engaged in the local culture. They tend not to have quite such a sense of superiority, to put it in a very kind of overgeneralized way. Mariah Graham, for example, says at one point, the best way to learn about something is to learn from those who do it. And so she sits down on the ground with potters outside of Valparaiso and have, has them teach her how to make a pot. She's always doing things like that. Um, so part of my argument is that because the Scots were marginalized within <coughs> Britain, even before the <laughs> Act of Union in 1707 that officially connected Scotland into the greater Union of Britain. They were seen as primitive, they were seen as backwards, they were seen as uncouth. Scots trying to rise through the governmental ranks or the military ranks would actually take elocution lessons so they could lose that Scottish accent and blend in. So especially early in the century, that explains why many of the Scots I study were passing as English. Um, but they had a very different perspective, and part of my argument comes back to the Scottish Enlightenment heritage that they had absorbed. So among other things, there was always an emphasis on education for women within Scotland. Scottish women kept their own last names. They had different legislation controlling their property rights, and so on and so forth. So women are apt to be more educated and feel a little bit more empowered, which is important for my argument. Uh, and then we've got David Hume, who's thinking very, very deeply about what it means to belong to a nation. So that's one thing many of these Scottish travelers are really engaging with in a way that the English travelers may not be always. We have Scottish Enlightenment historians who are engaged in what was called the debate of the new world, trying to figure out what made the Americas so different, and they developed a theory called stadial history, saying that human development progressed through stages, starting with hunters and gatherers and moving towards the commercial society of industrialized Britain, which was, of course, the highest stage of human development possible, right? So you see these Scottish travelers looking at the Chileans, and their main interest is, okay, how can we help these people move towards this highest stage? Which is very interesting in terms of current debates about political ideology as well, right? And then, of course, Adam Smith with the wealth of nations and that strong emphasis on free trade. So you see the Scots within Britain, I mean, within Chile, sorry, really thinking about how to raise Chile economically. And for them, the obvious answer is let British have free trade access to Chile. And so, again, one of the things that I'm interested in pursuing is the Chilean perspective on the dominance of this free trade ideology. So moving into these specific figures that I'll be focusing on. Thomas Cochran, a lot of you have probably heard of. <coughs> Absolutely. So he actually first sorry, became famous um, during the Napoleonic era in Britain, where he had all kinds of, he was a very, very colorful figure. And he had all kinds of midnight raids on the French. He snatched ships from under their noses. He would take a tiny schooner and capture a French vessel. Uh, so he became really famous first and then notorious. The public absolutely loved him. This was, again, the time of the rise of print culture. So there's broadsides about him, there's poems about him. Lord Byron said, there's no one I envy so much as Thomas Cochran because of his public persona and so on. At the same time, he became elected as a member of parliament, and then he became a real thorn in the side of the British establishment. And again, this you can see a lot of his Scottish context in this. Uh, and so he was not so popular with the government and with the naval officials because he kept trying to enact reforms. Uh, so he was eventually driven out of uh, parliament because of a scandal that's way too complicated to go into here. <coughs> 
and he finally decided to leave England. This was in 1817, and actually Chile was looking for somebody to found a navy because, of course, with the Spanish dominance, one of the Spanish regulations is that its colonies could not man ships because they didn't want any kind of competition with their naval power. So he was brought down to found, essentially, a navy. And because of his notoriety, he's still very influential within Britain and the US. So C.S. Forrester, Patrick O'Brien, their, their naval heroes are founded largely on the exploits of Thomas Cochran. Um, there are busts to him all over Scotland, all of this kind of thing. In Chile, there are monuments, there are place names, there's museums, and still to this day, I believe it's on the Chilean Naval Day, there's a formal flag, a wreath laying ceremony on Cochrane's tomb in Westminster Abbey. So there's a great saturation in the historical memory of this figure. <coughs> there also there were lots of his, um, artistic representations. So this was the Chilean Navy, four ships. That's what he started with. And then he went up and down the coast, ransacking the Spanish ships, capturing harbors, and stealing Spanish ships and turning them into naval vessels for the Chilean Navy. And of course, he went from Chile to Peru, to Peru and then to Brazil, and really helped to secure independence by defeating along the coast. This is one of his famous exploits. He took Valdivia Harbor in the dead of night with very few men relative to the Spanish power. Um, just before I go on to grab. What I'll be doing in Chile is looking at what is left unsaid in all of this historical memory relative to Cochrane. So he did have a lot of less heroic moments in Chile, just as he did back in Britain. So decades after his time here, he published what he kind of immodestly called his Narrative of Services in the Liberation of Chile, Peru, and Brazil from Spanish and Portuguese domination, which implies that he sort of did it single-handedly, right? Um, he also continually refers to the fact that the Spanish fleet called him El Diablo, what he doesn't mention is some of the less flattering nicknames that he was given, especially by Chilean officials. So for example, General San Martin, who of course was the Argentinian independence fighter who captained the Chilean army, among others. Martin, San Martin dubbed Cochran Il Metallico Lord because he said all he wants is to get money. So later in life, San Martin called him a gringo badulaque, amrantito, que cuanto no podía embolsicarse, lo consideraba robo, which is the gringo rogue or idiot who, when he couldn't get rich, considered himself robbed. And when you read this travel narrative called memoir of Cochran's, he's obsessive about people who didn't pay him the things he feels he was owed. This is partly because he is projecting Chilean or British naval practices <coughs> onto Chile. So in the British Navy, if you captured a ship, you got half of whatever was on that ship. That was not true in Chile. They actually needed that wealth to fund the independence movement. So I'm interested in finding out how Chilean historians see Cochrane's role why he still figures so largely in the national imaginary? Those are some of my research questions. Moving on to Maria Graham. So she was a travel writer who wrote books about India, about Spain, about Chile, and about Brazil. She set sail for Chile in 1821, accompanying her husband, who was a naval captain sent to safeguard British interests along the Chilean coast and the Brazilian coast. He died rounding Cape Horn, and she 
decided to stay on in South America, which she did. She eventually became the governess of the first um, princesses of Brazil, after Brazil declared independence. Her legend continues as well, but what is really interesting to me, because gender is one component of my study, is that her legend is almost always in relationship to her supposed romance with Cochrane, which seems very unlikely to have happened at all, but they were very close friends. They were two Scots in Chile, right? So this is a really awful romance novel <laughs> published in Britain. There's another <coughs> one published in Chile uh, that is called La Miradora by Ed Esther Edwards, which La Miradora is the one who looks out to sea. So it's as if she's just constantly staring out to see whether Cochrane's coming over the horizon. <coughs> This is actually quite a good film on her life that was made by Valeria Sarmiento just a few years ago. But even there, in the publicity for the film, you see this romance, right? Even though that's not what Sarmiento focuses on primarily. So in Chile, what people are still talking about is her travel narrative because she published an excellent account of the everyday life of Chileans during the independence era. And Chileans themselves were a little bit too busy winning independence to talk about what they ate every day, how they decorated their houses, so on and so forth. So she's actually great for sociologists, love her in Brazil and in Chile for that reason. This is one of her illustrations. The original editions had these beautiful hand-tinted illustrations. That is Graham herself. That's her only known self-portrait being carried through Chile. She also was an avid botanist. She <coughs> contributed to Kew Gardens collection. Kew Gardens had just been founded, so she's really involved in science. Um, she also wrote an account of an earthquake in Valparaiso in 1821, which was roundly poo-pooed. Of course, she couldn't join the Royal Geological Society as a woman, but she sent in this account. The geologist said, obviously false. What she said is that there were differentials in the level of the ground after the earthquake, that there were gaps, and she measured the gaps. Um, and Darwin came to Chile two decades later and absolutely supported everything Graham had said. But of course, we had to have a man come and say, yeah, 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 she was right. <laughs> so one of the things I'm working on uh, is <coughs> what she actually contributed to the history of, the, of science, rather than what she contributed in her romance with Cochran. <coughs> and with both of these figures, I'll be working, of course, mostly on the Chilean perspective, on everything they contributed to Chilean culture, to the Chilean historical memory, those kinds of questions. So, thank you very much. Thank you.